Welcome to Restaurant Influencers presented by Entrepreneur. My name is Sean Walchef, founder of Cali Barbecue and Cali Barbecue Media. In life, in the restaurant business, and in the new creator economy, we learn through lessons and stories. We're so grateful for Toast, our primary technology partner, for believing in storytelling, um, for believing in technology, giving a barbecue restaurant owner the ability to put on a show with Entrepreneur. Um, and to bring on guests like we have today. If you believe in personal branding, if you don't believe in personal branding, today is your episode. Um, we have one of the greatest people on earth, one of the, the biggest thought leaders, Chris Doe. He is an a, a Emmy award-winning designer. He is the CEO and founder of The Future. It is an online education platform, and they are on a mission to teach 1 billion people to do what they love. The one thing that I love about this audience is these are this is an audience of people that like to stay curious, to get involved and know how to ask for help. Um, you don't listen to a podcast, you don't tune into content if you're not a curious person, if you're not trying to level up and all of these hospitality leaders that level up to our show, they're, they're in for a treat. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Sean. I'm happy to be here. I'm super grateful, man. Um, we're gonna start with the, my favorite random question, which is where in the world is your favorite stadium, stage, or venue? Oh my goodness. All right, I'm not a big sports guy, so I'm gonna take the stadium off the list. It's fine. Um, probably the Hollywood Bowl for an event because okay. of the amphitheater, the history, the design of it. And I've been there a couple of times, I don't really do love it. It's an outdoor amphitheater. Okay, we're gonna go to the Hollywood Bowl. And after you're done with your Euro tour, which uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to find all these people that are going to come out to your classes all over the world. You're putting on business classes, branding classes all over the world. And um, we all know as, as teachers, educators, coaches, that there's a special class of people, the people that raise their hands, the people that sit in front, the people that are willing to be vulnerable. Well, those people, the select group is going to come to the Hollywood Bowl. And I'm going to get entrepreneur. I'm going to get toast. I'm going to get the future. We're going to get a bunch of brands to sponsor this TED TEDx style hospitality branding conference. I'm going to put you on center stage. I'm going to say, Chris, you did it. You taught a billion people how to do what they love. What does it look like? Wow. That moment will be an incredible moment in my life. And it's, it's such a big, hairy, audacious goal that I feel like I'd probably be like 75, 85 years old at that point. <laughs> so I'm out there on my walker, I'm looking back and you know, it reminds me of this one video. Um, I think it was Schindler, uh, maybe it was Schindler, somebody, somebody who saved a lot of people in the concentration camps, uh, maybe it's not. And then they packed the theater with survivors and, uh -huh. and grandchildren and he didn't know and they were doing this tribute to him. And then the host turns to the audience and says, uh, if you've been saved or helped by this man, please stand up and then it just, hit him like a truck in the face. And it was such an emotionally stirring moment. I'm sure I screwed up some of the facts on this story, but it's just like to think that you can have an impact on the lives of that many people is just an incredibly humbling feeling. So it would just be with the deepest amount of gratitude that I would just express to the audience. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I've been following you. I think I found you on Clubhouse uh, early pandemic time and sure. uh, you're putting on incredible rooms. You have over 80,000 followers on that platform alone, but I'm going to take you back to yesterday. So we're, we're recording this on uh, February 1st, 2023. Um, but yesterday you sent out a tweet and you said, I'm 51. Mm -hmm. I started YouTube at 42. I got serious on IG at 46. YouTube subs are now at 2.1 million. IG followers, 880,000, LinkedIn, 421,000, Twitter, 100,000. I did it. You can too, but you have to start. Give before you ask. Focus on getting better and not the numbers. Learn before you scale. That pretty much sums up everything I believe. You know, and it's the, the most positive reaction I've gotten from a tweet ever in the history of my Twitter usage. And I was a little blown away by it. But here's the thing, there are a couple of people, there's always a couple of people who's <laughs> like, I don't care about social media numbers, this is unhealthy. Now the person says, well, just because you can do it because you're an OG and the algorithm works in your favor. Uh, it's just like a lot of hate. I was thinking, this is a message of empowerment. Whatever your goal is in life, if somebody has told you you're too old, you're too young, you're too skinny, you're too fat, you're too dark, you're too light, it's time to say, you know what, I'm taking, responsibility for my life. I'm going to take action. I'm going to put the big goal in front and not the little goal. The little goal is I need to make money. I need to convert clients. I want followers. I want to be loved and liked and appreciated. 
the big goal is about self-development, yes. about learning. And the best way I know how to learn is to teach. And that's what I'm talking about. So then I get some hate, not a lot, relatively speaking, a little bit of hate. I'm like, what world do these people live in that they can just look at the lens through this lens of darkness versus the lens of light? Like, I want to shine light. And I guess there's such a thing as negative light. Yeah. I think when I, I mean, we, we talk to restaurant owners, hospitality leaders, and we teach them smartphone storytelling. You know, you, you, don't, you don't need permission to tell your own story. No one's coming to tell your story. It was a big revelation for us as a barbecue brand in San Diego. You know, we opened in 2008, location, location, location. We picked a bad location. We mm. picked a tough business and we picked mm. a tough category. Um, but what it did teach us was that the smartphone was here, web 2.0. We started doing a bunch of things that restaurants didn't do. And now, you know, we're grateful to have a stage to have people on like you that understand that this world of abundance, you know, it's a lot of when we get to the ego and we get to fear of posting on on social you know, on any platform, you talk about it a lot. And I love the fact that you talk about it. And I'm sure a lot of your students and people that follow you tell you that you, you, you you're an introvert. You're, mm -hmm. you say that you're an introvert. You say that you were terrified of going on camera. Can you bring us back to that journey for the people that are listening here that, you know, they know that they have a story. I mean, I tell, you know, leaders all the time, especially on a platform like LinkedIn, you know, we're there consuming content. Your voice matters. If you're listening to this podcast, your voice matters and it doesn't matter. You don't need the social media department's approval to talk about what you do and why you love doing what you do. Yeah, there's a, a stark contrast between what I would describe as old media versus new media. Old media meant that there are a few gatekeepers who allow certain anointed individuals through this, this gate. And, and those people reap the rewards of attention, fame, and were able to leverage their knowledge from other people. Old media sounds like book publishers, TV and radio, yep. and, and certain events that are so exclusive that to be invited would be like an achievement in your lifetime. New media comes along and says, you know what, let's democratize access. Let's give everyone who's willing to use and exercise their voice a platform and let the best content win. It's not 100% fair, but it's pretty close to it. And I don't know anything is 100% fair. Yeah. So in this new space, we, we tend to think extroverted personalities have all the fun, get all the attention and command and suck all the oxygen out of the social media rooms. And I'm here to tell you, if you have a thought in your head and you can articulate it in one form or the other, in written, in spoken word, on stage, in performance, in puppetry, shadow dancing, whatever it is that you do, if you can express and communicate an idea that touches someone, that entertains them, that helps them to achieve a goal that they want in their life, you have tremendous power. And I don't talk about the kind of global dominating power, but power that you can actually impact the life of one other human being. And that's an incredible amount of power. I grew up as a refugee, as an immigrant from Vietnam to the United States. Um, English is my second language. And my parents didn't have the time or the awareness of how to help us integrate into American culture. So as you can imagine, this is a whole new world. Even though I was very young, I felt something was off. Few people around me looked like me. And my response to all that stimuli was to retreat inward instead of stepping up. I remember in junior high, Mr. Tuttle's class, we stood around the edge of the room and he would go through and give each one of us a word. And it was a spelling bee competition. I didn't know it at the time, but he was going, okay, spell this, spell this. And so we'd go, if you missed it, you'd sit down in the center of the room. Cool. I'm one of two people left standing and I win it and I'm not even trying. And I'm like, great, let's go back to normal class. And then he says, hey, I would like for you to represent our class in a spelling bee competition. Now, normally nerdy Asian kids like myself would look at that as an honor. I said, do I have to do this thing because I prefer not to? Yes. And Mr. Tuttle is one of the most amazing teachers I've had. And he said, I'm not going to pressure you to do anything you don't want to do. You think about it. We'll send number two if that's what you want. And that's just a story of me retreating. And all my life I've been retreating. Such at a point in which my business coach, many, many years later, I'm talking about in my 30s and 40s here, he says to me, you're like the world's best kept secret. You go and teach a small group of private art school kids, but other than that, you hide from your clients, you don't go out there and you have tremendous things that you can share with the world. And so that was him gently putting a boot to my backside <laughs> and saying, get out there for lots of different reasons. Mostly so that you don't hurt your business because that's what you're doing. You're yes. hurting your business. And that thought, 
hit me really hard because I was thinking, so if I don't go out there and we don't get business, I'm going to have to do something that I hate doing, which is to lay off people. Yes. And so those people who've entrusted me in guiding this company, being the spokesperson for the company, generating new business and new ideas, I'm letting them down and I can't put that on me. So it's been a long, slow journey, multiple years of slowly working myself up into the point at which I wasn't looking for the exit door. Anytime somebody asked me, would you consider speaking? And now a quick break from restaurant influencers to share an exciting new offer from our sponsor, Atmosphere TV. Go to atmosphere.tv forward slash BBQ to not only get Atmosphere TV for free, but also our audience is given the gift of $200 in ad credits, as well as free activation. Join more than 40,000 other venues who use Atmosphere TV by signing up with the code BBQ at atmosphere.tv forward slash BBQ. Keep guests entertained with Atmosphere TV because you have the ability to turn your promotions and your advertisements onto your television with this platform. The simple plug and play device lets you take control of the content on your screens. Keep guests entertained, engaged, and informed of real-time specials, career opportunities, and announcements that you can personalize within your own custom content dashboard. Tap into great channels such as America's Funniest Home Videos, Fashion, Throttle, Chive TV, Sports Highlights, Red Bull, Real Madrid, along with unbiased news and entertainment. There is something for everyone. Over 60 curated channels of short form, entertaining content to choose from right at your fingertips. They also have an incredible ad supported network that allows you to not only market within your four walls, but also locally or nationally if you desire. The platform gives you full control to dial in your marketing efforts. Please go and visit atmosphere.tv slash BBQ and let them know restaurant influencers sent you. It's, it's an incredible journey. And I love the fact that you're so open. I mean, building in public is something that we believe in. And that's something why I obviously was always attracted to your content is that you share the secrets you, you have conversations about money, you talk about why is money shouldn't be a difficult conversation yet. So many reasons, cultural reasons, the way we were, the way we were raised so many different reasons. But I mean, your former company, you did $80 million in billing, yet you decided to walk away. What yeah. was what give bring us back to there? Yeah. So we're on a good year. The best year we've ever had as a service design company making commercials and music videos was really close to seven million dollars a year. That was an amazing year. It's giving away ginormous bonuses to people, tens of thousands of dollars to each amazing. employee. Right. I was like, I was contemplating should I buy a Porsche for one of my employees? It, it was like <laughs> that good, right? You're tripping over money. Yeah. On a normal year, we're doing anywhere between four and a half to five million dollars a year. Anything below $4 million, we would be losing money because yep. it's an expensive thing to do to run a production company. And I'm doing this for going on 20 years. It started in 1995. But here's the thing. Somewhere along the way, I kind of get bored with doing this. And, you know, people say this all the time, and I'm guilty of perpetuating this idea that if I only had that one client, that one project, my entire life would change. And you would say, like, if I could work with Nike, well, we did three Nike commercials. If yeah. I could work with Microsoft or Google or Atari, we've worked with everybody. And here's the shocking news. Nothing changes. <laughs> Nothing changes. <laughs> did you just tell the secret to everybody? Well, I guess. I mean, it you is keep the thinking secret. that. Yeah, it's it this, this carrot that we, nobody did this. So we dangle the carrot ourselves and say, work harder, uh, grind. Uh, sacrifice your relationships, uh, sacrifice your own mental health and your physical health, sacrifice, and that one job will make you. And it doesn't. I mean, we've worked with Noel Barkley on that crazy music video. We worked with Justin Timberlake on Love Stone. We worked with Coldplay. And you know, here's the thing. You get that momentary blip of activity and attention to what it is that you're doing, and then it goes away. And that's the problem with that kind of metric for success. It's short, it's fleeting. And it's like a fire that needs a lot of fuel to keep going. And we get caught in that so that we wake up one day. And it's like, why did I sacrifice all my life to pursue something only so I can have a life so that I can sacrifice my life? So here I am on the side thinking about what else is the next move for me? And the conversation became crystallized in my mind because I was having a discussion with John, my financial advisor. And I have, I have this meeting. We have quarterly meetings. I'm sitting there with him and my wife's sitting over here. 
And I say to him, John, tell me how many more years do I need to work in order for us to just retire and I'm done with this? And he goes, well, Chris, that's an interesting conversation, flips through some paperwork. He says, you could have retired two and a half years ago. <laughs> nice. And I turned to my wife, I'm like, what? She's like asking me for three more years. And it's one of these things where your wife keeps saying, just give me three more years every year. It's, so it's always three more years because my, my wife comes from a place of financial insecurity, even though she grew up with money, the idea that we'd run out of money scares her. And I get that. And so I'm, I'm like, well, that day I'm driving home and she denies saying that we don't have enough money. I'm like, Oh, what am I going to do then? Yeah. If my goal was to work to retire, which is not a good goal, by the way. Yes. Then I'm kind of done. So it took a while to figure out what the next move was, but now I knew I was searching for something greater. Like what kind of thing do I want to pass on? How, how can I serve people? Um, I think Muhammad Ali said something like this. Your, your, your time on uh, like, Oh, I'm going to butcher this. Let me look it up. <laughs> you it's look such it a up. Good quote. Yeah, I'll do that. But I just fully believe in that. Okay. Look Let it me up, look at this quote up. and I'll share it with you. Okay. Okay. Here he goes. Service to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. And rent is due. That's it. So I've taken up a lot of time and space. And it's time for me to get back. And former President Obama was quoting somebody else when he said this. Like the way success works is you're supposed to send the elevator back down. And so here I'm, I'm in this place where I'm like, okay, I've achieved my shot at the American dream. I've achieved more than I could have dreamt possible. What can I do to help others? And so I'm starting to figure out I can teach, but I need to teach at scale. Yes. Right. Because when you teach at a private art school, it's great. You have the best students, best facilities, and it's very prestigious. But you're only helping eight students at a time who come from mostly families with means. It's not always the case. I know it's a big blanket statement. But when tuition is $22,000 a semester, you're not going to reach a lot of people. And so I started to, with the insistence of my friend, Jose Caballé, to start to make videos on YouTube. And I'm a wreck. My jaw is so <laughs> tightly clenched, Sean, that you won't believe how much it was hurting me physically to do the content. Like when Were people are like, like physically sick, <laughs> physically ill, right? Like knots in the stomach and jaw sore the next day. And I just could not figure out why. And then, you know, I'm a bright guy. So after doing this several times, I'm like, do a video, jaw hurts. There's a connection. Yes. And so it takes a while. It took six to eight months for me to like, okay, what are we doing here? I got to get through this. And so eventually you do. If you expose yourself enough to the things that you don't like, eventually you like them or dislike them a little less. And at some point, dare I say, you might even enjoy it. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's interesting to me. We we teach business owners and business leaders all the time to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yes. You know, it's it's amazing to me to think about where we are in what we call the creator economy. Yes. You know, so many creators, digital storytellers, people that are good with audio, words, images, and video to put their ideas out on the internet, they want to be business owners. You know, they want yeah. to have brand deals, they want to figure out the business side of it business owners, entrepreneurs, we're the original creators. Like we're the ones that actually have been creating things, except when it comes to telling a story on the internet yeah. for all these different platforms, people shut down. Yeah. They think that the internet wants a commercial. And mm -hmm. what we try to tell people is the internet wants you. You know, that's why I love when you're talking about personal brand and you're empowering people to use their voice. I mean, one of your posts, you said, do personal brands matter? You said, Apple has 8.7 million followers. Tim Cook has 13.7 million. Tesla has 18 million. Elon has 116 million. Virgin has 250,000. Richard Branson has 12.6 million. Why do personal brands matter? Well, let's try to understand this because I'm a student of branding and advertising and marketing now. And when you look at companies that have lost their way, like we don't understand who they are and what they stand for. They've diversified their products and services. Maybe the quality of the product isn't the way it used to be. And what do they do? These really large corporations, they hire branding and marketing firms to come in to rebrand them. And I've, I've had the privilege to talk to some people who work at the very, high, very, very highest level, working with Fortune 100 companies. And they said, you know what? It's all about going back to find the founder's story. 
the the Hewlett Packard story starting in the garage, the Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak in the garage. Like, why do we start this? What is it? We've lost our way. And this is a very natural progression. Let's say you and I, we start a company and it's going well. We hire people. In order to manage those people, we hire managers to manage those people. And we keep doing this over the course of 5, 10, 20 years. Sometimes it could just be in one year. We've lost touch with the people who actually work for us. And they have no idea who we are. They have no idea why we started and what our bigger purpose is. So most entrepreneurs who achieve any kind of real success, they were trying to solve a problem. There was an itch that they needed to scratch and no one else could do it for them. And they do this. And, and by, by consequence of their success, there's a gap between that founder story and the people who are connected to it. And so we, we would consider these like frontline employees, the one that are in the trenches yeah. that your customers are actually interacting with. And for many companies, it's customer service or it's sales. It's not in the boardroom. It's not at the executive C level where people are interacting with you. They have no idea who you are. Yeah. So what these marketing consultants and these branding consultants do is they come in and they go back to that and they interview lots and lots of people and they get back to that story and they're trying to reshare that story internally first so that the culture can be aligned around this and then externally. The late Tony Shea talked about this in his book, uh, Delivering Happiness. He said, forget the brand, get the culture. Because if you get the culture right, the brand will follow. And he posits this example. He's like, let's say you're at a bar and it's crowded and there's a bunch of jerks at the bar. And then you find out they all work at Microsoft. So it doesn't matter what Microsoft says who they are. Yeah. Now your association with Microsoft is a bunch of tech jerks. And that's going to happen. So it's very important that you're clear about who you are, what you stand for, your mission, vision, and values, especially your values, and how you hire and fire based on this that's going to ultimately determine your brand. So if Apple wants to keep, keep the audience and community, us, the diehard fanboys, believing that they're an innovative technology company that thinks through things to make life simple, to use technology to empower us, they need to hire people who think like that, who behave like that, so that it seeps through all of what they do. And this is important. So what I'm talking about is, do personal brands matter? Well, in, in brands, there's a person, the founder. Yeah. And so, yeah. So Virgin Atlantic, without Richard Branson, is just another company. But he's really good at telling his story. Now, Elon is very good at telling his story as well. Maybe too good lately. Like Eva will pray. <laughs> no, so we'll put that aside. Pre him going bananas on Twitter. Yes. Like pretty good at enrolling us in a story, right? Yes. Yeah. And there's tools and techniques to do that. I want to point out something. There's a story I, I want to share. There's a moment in time when Elon Musk is doing his annual report, like on the stage and just talking to people, right? Yes. He says, I'm here to tell you about the new uh, three series, right? And he goes, wait, before I do this, and it looks like as if it was totally unplanned. I believe it's totally planned. Where he's like, hold on, okay, wait, I forgot to tell you what we're trying to do. Now, why would Tesla share its patents with any car company? Because people think we're in competition with car companies. We are not. We're in competition against global climate change. And he shifted the conversation, right? And then all of a sudden, my wife is looking at me like, this is why we buy this car that's quite expensive. Yes. This is why we want to support it. And he explains why. Like, you, you bought the Roadster so that he could pay for the S. And you guys who bought the S paid for it so that we can develop the three and make this a success so that everyone who wants one theoretically can afford one. So he did some brilliant things I want to share with your audience. He changed the game in terms of who he was competing against. He's not competing, competing against Mercedes or Audi yep. or, or, or uh, Lexus. He's not even in the car category anymore. He's in like, we have this urgent problem that we have to solve in our lifetime. If we don't, our children and our children's children are going to inherit a problem that's going to be devastating to them, quite possibly. So then he labeled the enemy, not the car companies. He's like, forget yep. you. I'm not even competing against you. I'm competing against this thing that's affecting all of us, no matter where you live. And so if you, as a brand, can find an enemy and label that enemy, you can enroll a tribe that gets really emotional about who you are and what you do, that they're willing to do emotional things and irrational things and pay more for something where there's a lower cost alternative. That's the key. 
So I know you help solopreneurs, helping them with their personal branding, but you also help executives, uh, people, any anyone that's in business that wants to to level up their business game. We have so many hospitality leaders that are listening. Well, what's the unlock uh, across when you have multiple students that come to you and say, Chris, I was scared of instead of hiding behind my company, yeah, putting my own personal brand and my thoughts on Instagram and on TikTok and on Twitter and on LinkedIn. What's the unlock? What, what, what's the common themes that you see in your students? Um, the, the big challenge that everybody has is they pursue the result that they want versus the path to get to the result that they want. And this is a big challenge. For example, I want to grow my followers. I want to be liked. So they try to do things that they think are likable and it's the exact opposite. It's yeah. when you start to accept who you are, not just the strengths and the things we all like to celebrate, yeah. but your vulnerabilities, then you become real, you become relatable. I did this Google search the other day, the top 20 most hated celebrities in the world. <laughs> Gwyneth, Gwyneth Paltrow is high up on that list. Really? Yes, very high. <laughs> and then Anne Hathaway is very high on that list. And why? Because they have like porcelain, perfect skin, perfect figure, perfect teeth and hair, and they're statuesque. They're beautiful and they're talented. They can sing and dance and act. Come on. Like, are you telling me you roll out of bed looking like that every single day? So that could be the case. And the problem here is not very many people live that life. We didn't come from that perfect yeah. beginning. We don't have the entertainment parent that got us here. We're not married to some super famous person too. We're not worth hundreds of millions. So your story becomes unrelatable. I don't know how to relate to it. I like your message. I like you, but I can't relate. So the first thing I try to get people to do is not look at your strength, but look at where you're vulnerable. The things that you're embarrassed to admit that you carry some shame or guilt or wish you could change about yourself. I just lean into that. Yeah. And I would label that too. Cause every time you label something, you kind of take power back. When did you lean into it yourself? Did you pretty have any aha uh, 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 moments? Yeah, pretty early, I think. I think first it begins with the game of self-acceptance, uh, le learning that true confidence comes from not just true strength, but true vulnerability, and learning how to love yourself. And it sounds such like a strange concept, and I'll share a conversation with you that sometimes people are like, oh, really? Okay. So one day I'm, I'm home, and we're in the kitchen, and my wife and I are talking about something, and she was remarking about how our oldest son was doing something so cool and amazing. And I said to her kind of just offhandedly, yeah, we know who he gets that from, you know, <laughs> we know, we just know, right? And she's like, oh, God, you're so full of yourself. You just love yourself so much, don't you? That's what she said. And she's trying to dig at me. Sounds like my wife. Right. That's and awesome. I'm like, huh, okay. I said, you know, you have a point. I do love myself. But let me ask you this question. If I didn't love myself, who would I get love from? And I think people who don't love themselves are kind of repulsive. And what they do is they ask you to love them more than they love themselves. And you could do that for some time. And then you'd have to prop me up. You'd have to give me daily affirmations. You'd have to constantly encourage me. And, and then you would spend all your time and all your attention on supporting me. And then what is left for you? I guess nothing. Is that the relationship you would like to have? One with somebody who doesn't love themselves? I love myself and I wish you loved yourself more. So, I mean, it's things like this and then they start to manifest. Now, granted, every time we step out of our zone of comfort, we step into the unknown, we start to question that love again. Yeah. That are we being, are we worthy of being loved? So in order to be loved, you have to feel like you're worthy of being loved. And this is a very important thing. So here's another funny story and people are gonna think this guy is so full of himself and it's okay if you think that. <laughs> Cause I do love myself. <laughs> Right. I, I said, I'll read this message. And somebody's just glowing about something I just done. And they're like, I'm your number one fan. And my wife smiles. She goes, that's why you love the internet so much. That's why you're on social. Cause every single day you get hundreds of affirmations. I said, that's not why, but I'm sure that's helping a little bit. Right. And she goes, that person's not your number one fan. I'm like, who is? She goes, I am. I'm like, sometimes it's hard to tell, honey. It is a little hard to tell from time to time, yes. you know, yes. that that's the case. But I really appreciate it. I gave her a hug and a kiss. And I said, but you're not. She goes, yes, I am. I said, no, because I am. The line <laughs> starts after me. You do need to understand that. 
And she laughs again, you know? So this is the kind of thing that I want for people because you know what? So many of us have grown up in an imperfect environment yeah. that our parents, despite their well intentions, they were not fully equipped. They're like children struggling with their own trauma. And then they raise children with their trauma and it just gets passed on from generation to generation. And so one of the things that I know is when I see people out in the wild and I share an idea with them, something that shifts their mindset, I've done, I've not done this on purpose, but I've seen grown, big, strong men with muscles and beards and tattoos just fully break down in front of me because no one has ever said what I say to them, which is, you're a good person. You're doing the best you can. Please take it easy on yourself because you'll need that for tomorrow. And that's yeah. all it takes, Sean. I don't know if you can believe that or not. And then their eyes well up with tears. And I've, I'm not talking about like, you know, um, eyelash in my eye. I've had men, Europeans, believe it or not, who are very reserved, yeah. bury their face in their hands and just sob. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you talking about it, leading with it, leading with love, leading with leading with vulnerability. I mean, I remember the first time that I went to therapy and I was a young man, I was 26 and mm. um, my family was going through some really tough times. My brother was in, you know, a very dark place. And I remember my therapist telling me, hey, Sean, you know, when you go on a plane and you're traveling with kids, what do they tell you to do when the when the oxygen mask comes down? And, you know, I didn't even have kids at the time. I wasn't married. And I was like, I got to take care of the kids, got to take care of the women. You know, that's the chivalrous thing to do as a man. It's like, no, you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you, otherwise you're useless to everybody else. And it was such a powerful statement for me. And especially now that I have a five-year-old son, a three-year-old daughter and a wife, but, you know, for the audience in the hospitality industry specifically, we spend our life giving to others. We give to our team, we give to our village, we give to our community, we are in service of others. And so many times we don't take care of ourselves. We don't prioritize putting that oxygen mask on ourselves so that we can actually be better for everyone else around us. What do you do to take care of yourself? Well, I have to make sure I'm a whole person before I try to help other people. And I get this a lot, you know, people ask me, how do I change my partner? How do I change my employee? How do I fix this problem with my clients? <laughs> and they'll go on and on about that. And they never like the answer I give them, which is, how about you just work on you? Because that's a pretty difficult job, don't you think? I said, I've tried for many years to try to change my wife. I've been unsuccessful. I'm batting <laughs> you zero. Too. Zero. Too, I'm at too. zero right now. Yeah. So imagine this is your life partner, the one that you trust with your life, and hopefully your partner trusts you with their life. Now you're going to tell me a client who gives you money, you're going to try and change them? Like, how is this even possible? Like, real change comes from within. When you change, the world around you changes. So what, what happens is, we want change to happen. We just don't want to do any of the work because it's difficult. So we look for problems in others to affect change and influence when we just need to work on ourselves. Uh, I know Jordan Peterson has some controversial positions on things, but there is some truth to at least one of the things he said, which is all these young people trying to save the world and the planet and, and change work culture. Why don't you just clean up your room? Like just start there. It's, <laughs> I mean, can you do that? Yes. Can you yes. make your bed? Can you show up to work on time? Can you do the basics first? And then let's talk about changing the world. But it's much easier to roll out of your bed, disheveled, having not gone to work, and go and tell other people what they should do. And they're out there and they're just pointing their finger. You should do this. You should do this. So my thing is keep pointing the finger, but you're pointing at the wrong person. Go look in the mirror, point at that person and say, this is what you need to do. And I know this. If I want to influence anybody like my children, and I want to say, stay healthy, boys. Take care of yourself. I have two adult boys now. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to eat right. And then I'm going to let my actions be the model in which they can choose for themselves, whether or not they want to participate in this or not. It's not about me tapping on the shoulder, uh, you know, 100 pounds overweight, eating a, a cheeseburger and potato chips saying you should eat better. Like, how are they supposed to reconcile the difference between what they see and the words that they hear? So here's one of the most amazing things. My boys have been pretty averse to working out and we have a home gym. And something miraculous has happened, Sean. I go into the room and the weights are not in the same place that I put them in. Oh. Somebody has been here and I know it's not my wife. 
And so now both my boys, when at least when my, my college son is at home, they're in there at night. They're doing what their old man is doing. Yeah. And I want to set that positive example for them. So I don't smoke. I don't swear. I don't, I've never done any drugs. I've never drank any drop of alcohol. And that's how I'm going to live my life. I'm not saying that they can't. I don't even need to. Yeah. Because when they see people drink, it's like a strange thing for them. And, you know, speaking of therapy, there was um, a well-known uh, author in, in, uh, in, in child psychology who spoke at one of my son's, uh, like, assemblies. And he said, here's the thing about your children. They had this thing. It's called a strong will. Do not break them of this will. Do not exert your opinions, your ideas over them because you will break this will. And it might seem like that's the game that you need to play. But when you're not around, and the true test of parenthood is when you're not around, what will they do? How will they behave? How will they act? And they're going to need that strong will to stand up to their peers and the pressure they're going to feel. So I always try to encourage my wife, let them be. We have these healthy guardrails on the side. Don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt others. Don't cheat. Don't lie. Don't steal. Everything else is fair game. Life is meant for you to make mistakes and make choices that you're going to regret later. That's how you learn. And I'm so proud because sometimes I hear stories about what has happened. And they're the only one who's gone this way when everyone else has gone the other way. It doesn't even matter if they're right. They just have the courage and the conviction to stand alone on an island, fully resolved that this is what they want to do. It's parenthood. It's learning how to be a dad every day. I mean, I, I, I put in my, my social bio that I'm, I'm a new dad and people are like, oh, congratulations. How old's your, your son? I'm like, he's five. My daughter's three. <laughs> Every day is a new day for me to learn how, learn how to be a better dad and a better husband. Yeah. You know, I can't, I can't be a better dad if I don't prioritize being good to my wife. And um, that's something I'm learning how to do every single day. Can you tell me about when you have so many people engaging across your platforms and all of a sudden you decide that you want to uproot yourself and go to Europe. Tell me about the idea behind these in real life events and the magic that's happened um, at some of these meetups. Because I've been following your your meetups where you you end up somewhere. Where where in the world is Christo? And you end up somewhere <laughs> and you can't believe the reception yeah. of how many people follow you. I mean, that's the, you know, if anyone gets anything from this this conversation, I want you to understand that your words matter you listening to this show, your words matter, but you have to start somewhere, you know, back to the tweet in the beginning, you have to start somewhere. And when you start, it's a dark place. Don't expect hundreds of thousands of followers. Don't expect people engaging. Just focus on the craft of storytelling, of per perfecting your voice. Now that you're where you are, why the Euro tour? Yes. So you, you actually posed the second question I'd like to answer in the reverse order here. Please. And there's a story, like a, a thought experiment I want everyone to participate in. So if you're driving, just clear your mind for a second. If you're like doing something like mowing the lawn, this is easy for you. Okay, I want you to imagine that you were like in an airplane going to an exotic location, the dream trip of your life with your friends and your family. And something horrible happens. The engine craps out. The plane goes down. You are now the sole survivor. It's like Tom Hanks in Castaway. You're washed ashore and there's not much for you to do. And after you start to figure out how to survive on your own, you've come to accept that this will be your last place. And one night you're walking along the beach. It's a warm night. The waves are lapping at the sand and you're walking there with the, the water on your feet and you're looking at the full bright moon. And something catches your eye, a little glint of light in the water. And you walk over to it and it's a glass bottle. And so now you have this opportunity and an idea comes upon you that before you should expire, you want to write some messages for the world, whatever that might be. So you fashion together some makeshift paper, things that you found, some charcoal, and you start to write. First, you just say whatever's on your mind. And then it occurs to you to be grateful, to thank all the people that you needed to thank so that they knew that you loved them, that what they did in your life mattered. It could be the third grade teacher who in shop who showed you some kindness. Maybe it was your therapist who helped heal something that was just so deep inside of you, some trauma you experienced. Then when you run out of that, you're sitting there and you're like, what else? Well, here are some lessons I've learned in my life, pain that I've experienced, what I got from it, and I hope by sharing that, it'll heal some of your wounds, and I just wish you the very best. 
So you write that and then you, you, you cork that sucker up and you toss it into the water and you let the waves carry it away. Long after you're gone across space and time, the bottle winds up on some distant beach, maybe in Florida, maybe in California somewhere. And some person picks it up. They open it and they read it. And at first they're like, this is interesting. Is this real? Oh, it is real. Oh my God. This is the words, the last thoughts of the dying person. And this is what they have to share. And something that you wrote in your story, in your gratitude and the lessons you've learned, brings a tear to the person's eye because it solves a problem. They needed to hear this this day in this exact moment. Maybe it's a young person who's going to college for the first time, the first college student in a generation of people. Maybe it's an older person who've lost touch with their friends and their family and their ch children. They've been estranged. Whatever it is, you've made a profound impact on one person's life. Now, here's the really cool part of the story. I mean, you're dead, so it doesn't matter. But the bottle's in the ocean. And imagine if the ocean were magical and that bottle multiplied to, say, 10,000. And it washed up on 10,000 different shores and it impacted 10,000 different lives. Some people throw it away. Some people recycle the bottle. Some people don't read it at all. But whoever is going to open it, who reads it with an open heart and an open mind, it transforms them. Now, this is a pretty fantastical story, right? I hope nobody is stranded on an island by themselves thinking about this. But to me, this is the real power and opportunity of social media and putting out a message into the world. Your ideas matter. Your actions count. The problem is if you don't share it with anybody in any way, no one will ever know. No one can gain from your life experience, from your stories, from this life that you've lived richly. And so we, we take it back to like why Euro Tour and why the meetups and all this kind of stuff. Well, I'm in Australia and I had the opportunity to do multiple workshops. And the feeling of doing the workshops and being around people for six, seven, eight hours of teaching and learning together really energized my soul. So for 15 odd years, I taught at a private arts school. And I wanted to recreate that experience at scale. Because it's all about scale. If you're going to reach a billion people, you have to work at scale. So I've been doing different things pre-pandemic, cameras, Zoom calls, inviting people to come into the studio to learn with me. It's not an eight-hour commitment. It's an hour and a half, two hours at most. And then they go along their way. And I'm able to broadcast that to the world. But workshops are my jam. I just want cameras there so that we can share it with more than the people that are in the room. So I think to my, myself and my team, what if we organize our own tour where I was going to do workshops and why not start with Europe? I like to travel, so this makes a lot of sense. I have European friends, let's do this. But that's just the beginning because if it works, I'll go to, of course, the United States, Canada, South America, Africa, Asia. I just wanna go out there and teach people because those people will go then on to teach other people. And that's the only way I've got a shot at making this work, Sean. Yeah, we uh, we say a rising tide lifts all leaderships. You know, the difference between a ship and a boat, because there's also a rising tide lifts all boats. Yes. Yeah, the difference between a ship and a boat is a boat can fit inside of a ship. So really, we're recruiting the ships. You mm -hmm. know, the people that listen to these shows, the people that consume the content, they're the ones that have the courage mm -hmm. to do the work, you know, because you got to get involved. You actually have to do the work. And that work is uncomfortable. And that work sometimes is lonely, but that's why you build community is so that we can all be there to support each other. Um, I do want to give a special shout out every single Wednesday and Friday on the social app Clubhouse. Uh, we do a digital hospitality leadership call. Um, anybody that's listening, please come to those rooms, come on stage. It's 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, but Phyllis Williams Strotter, um, she, I have developed a deep relationship with her because mm -hmm. she shows up uh, country brand mother, uh, ghetto mm -hmm. country brand mother. She's been phenomenal. She helped set up this interview. Um, so shout out to Phyllis. I know she's worked on her book. She's an incredible, incredible personality. Please follow her. We'll put a link into the show notes, but Chris, uh, is there somebody you want to give a shout out to somebody that's gone above and beyond on your team with this Euro tour? Um, I know it's it's entrepreneur. We're fortunate that we have a stage that goes out to to millions of people. Uh, anybody, I know, I know you always want to shout out the entire team, but <laughs> I'm about but to do that. So sing, you took that away sing, from me. Let's single somebody out. Yes, well, I, I will say this: that we move at a scale that 
betrays the small number of people that actually work at the company. So they're yeah. all hustling. There are only 12 of us full time and wow. about three or four more, a little bit more than that, who are working as independent contractors helping us. So at most, we're like 20 people. I don't Amazing. think we're that many. And so whenever I steer the boat or the ship in a different direction, the whole team's like, <sighs> okay, more work. What are we doing now? <laughs> you know? And I love them for it. So I'll shout out one person in particular right now. Her name is Annalie Hansen. She's not even officially on staff. She's one of our teachers. She does brand strategy and she's based out of Stockholm, Sweden. It was her insistence that we make this trip happen that was the catalyst for all the stuff, the insanity that ensued. She's like, I want you to come to Stockholm. I need to meet you in person. I'll wow. do all the work. We'll plan this. I don't need two cents from you. I just want to give back to you and the community. And so without her, none of this would happen. Now, of course, there's a whole host of other people behind the scenes making this happen. But I just, I love that. So if you, if some of your listeners are fans of ours who are thinking, we need to get you to this city. Well, if you put in a little bit of work, I will show up. But I don't have the resources, as you might think, to go anywhere and everywhere I want to go yeah. and not make it like a financial uh, pitfall or, or money pit for us. I can't afford to do that right now. So if people are interested in, in the Euro tour, I mean, we have yes. international listeners. How do, they, how do they find out more information? I, I will share a link with you. The, the link is too put long, it. but it's on Eventbrite. No problem. So we'll put it in the show notes. It's going to start on April 14th in London, and it's going to wrap up. Oh my gosh, I, I want to say in Porto or somewhere at the, uh, I, I forget, but the end of April. So we're, we're going to be there for a little bit over two weeks. I hope to be able to see you. And if you can't buy a ticket, just don't even worry about it because hopefully I'll have space in there somewhere to do a really quick meetup for like an hour. So we'll get some FaceTime together. That's amazing. And the best way for people to connect with your, your favorite digital playgrounds these days. Probably follow me on Twitter. I'm pretty active there. I'm yes. at the Chris Doe, but I'm at the Chris Doe on almost every social platform. Beautiful. And if you guys want to follow me, it's at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. Uh, we're grateful that you uh, spent so much time with us, shared your knowledge. Please follow him on all the platforms, Instagram, YouTube, um, the work that he does abundantly giving back to, um, to creatives, to business owners, to people that want to build a brand. Um, you truly are a, a master at, at, at teaching. And I can't wait for this uh, this billion to happen and for the Hollywood Bowl to to happen so uh, so I can be there in person to to say we talked about it on Entrepreneur back in the day. Yeah, I can't wait. I mean, that's like you looking to the crystal ball and seeing the future clearer than I have been able to articulate it. Uh, Sean, the, the biggest compliment someone can give to me is to call me a master teacher. I'm humbled by that. That's what I aspire to be. It's one of those things when, when I was teaching for those 15 years, I'll, I'll just say this. I had secretly hoped that my students would have voted me as the favorite teacher of the year. <laughs> I was never able to get that honor. There's a numbers game at play here. Teachers who teach 60 students at a time versus ones that teach eight. I have zero shot. So someday in my life, I will I aspire to win that accolade from the people that matter to me the most, which are my students. Well, as always, uh, stay curious, get involved, and don't be afraid to ask for help. We appreciate you guys. Thank you for subscribing to the show and share share the episode with a friend uh, a friend who needs it. And remember that your voice matters. Uh, please get out and start to share your stories on this uh, magical thing called the internet. And a special thank you to our title sponsor, Toast. Toast is the primary technology partner that we use at our restaurant, Cali Barbecue. It is also the primary technology partner that so many of the guests have shared with us on this show. People like Sam, the cooking guy, Stacy Poonkinney, Jeff Alexander. So many times the guests tell us that they're using Toast when we didn't even know that going into the interview. That is why we are so grateful that they sponsor this show. We want you to win. You that listen to this show, we want you to improve your digital hospitality. Toast is built for restaurants and it's built for you. Toast is the restaurant first platform that's built for your needs, whatever your size, concept, or ambitions. Improve your bottom line with a customizable platform that's easy to learn, use, and grow with. And it meets you where you are with all the right tools for your price point. If you have any questions about Toast, please DM me at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N, 
P W A L C H E F. I will get you the link to the right toast contact in your market. It's so important that if you listen to this show that you win, we want you to be on this show. Eventually let us know that you heard the show. You heard about toast. You implemented toast. You did a toast unboxing in your restaurant. Talk to us about how you've impacted your village, your city, your community, share your toast story with us. DM me today to learn more and be sure to check out toast.